Hello, fellow cyborgs, and welcome to my wrap up of the Book Buddy a thon. So, this was a read a thon that took place between the 7th and 13th of May, and it was a read a thon where you pair off with a buddy and then you have challenges and you do stuff. I will link my MBR down below if you want any more details about this bud Book Buddy a thon. Today is the wrap up, so I'm going to talk to you about the books I managed to finish in the week, and I'm going to do it in order of finishing, if that makes any sense. Also, before I get carried away. My book buddy was, of course, Acacia Ives, and I will link her amazing channel down below. Please go check her out if you are interested in mental illness and independent publishers and just having a grand old time and fairy tales and other things. So the first thing that I managed to finish during the book buddy-a-thon was Matilda by Roald Dahl. This was my first read of Matilda, and unfortunately, I only gave it two out of five stars. Unpopular opinions, ahoy! I didn't grow up reading Roald Dahl. I grew up knowing who Roald Dahl was, but when I was a child, I only wanted to read mermaid books and he didn't write any mermaid books. So I didn't really grow up reading his stories. So I don't have that nostalgia and childhood joy to go into his books with. When I read children's middle grade YA books, I go in hoping for a fun time, but also looking at the the subliminal messages that are being sent the reader. Young readers are very suggestible and it's important that if you're going to be writing to them that you're thinking about your audience and the fact that they may absorb things that you tell them. So that's my personal opinion. And I did not agree with practically any of the messages being sent in here. My review goes into a bit more detail, but to sum up, I had a huge problem with the fact that all of the mean, awful, neglectful, abuseful people are ugly and fat and big. I consider myself big and fat, and I also am not like model worthy, though I'm not terribly unattractive, and I don't consider myself mean and neglective and abusive, so I had a huge, huge problem with that. And then also on the flip side, all of the protagonists, Matilda, her friend Lavender, Miss Honey, and even Hortensia, who's this like in-between character, are all thin or small, fragile. So it just perpetuated this idea that your character is displayed through your appearance and if you are, have a bad character, then it's going to be displayed in ugly, fat, and big formats. No, 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 no. The only thing that I really enjoyed about Matilda was the handful of literary references, which I'm sure, sure is why a lot of people really love Matilda, but there were a lot of things that he didn't deal with adequately or that just didn't get actually wrapped up. It ended really abruptly, and I don't think that I would be, read this to a child, and that's a huge problem when it's children's fiction. So that's my unpopular opinion. I'm I'm not degrading anyone who thinks differently from me, but that was just my experience with Matilda. I'm sad that I couldn't adore this like a lot of people do, but mm, hey. Next, I picked up the comic Rose by Jeff Smith, illustrations by Charles Vess. I gave this two stars as well, unfortunately. I found that the plot line was fairly basic um, as far as like fantasy tropes go. I wasn't super impressed with the illustrations in here by Charles Vess, unfortunately. I characteristically really love Charles Vess, but I found that his like consistency with his faces was off, especially with Rose, the main character with red hair here. So I thought that she looks very different from this panel to this panel to this panel, and then there are even more drastically different face structures as this goes throughout. If illustrators can't nail like the personality of someone's face, you know, the, the attributes of someone's face, no matter like what they're doing, what expression they're making, I'm like meh. Also, there were some really awesome character designs in, well not character designs, world designs and landscapes and stuff in here, but there was this, let me find him, Great Red Dragon. And I didn't think he meshed well with the world at all. The other dragons are really like cool, like Chinese dragons or medieval dragons. So here's like another one of the dragons, but then this is the red. He looks like Clifford mated with a Muppet and gave me this dragon. So I had my definite issues with the illustrations. And frankly, this is a Charles Vess. I, in general, really love Charles Vess's, you know, illustration style. So the fact that I wasn't impressed by it in this, like knocked an entire star off practically. This is a prequel to a series. I believe it's a standalone prequel, but 
perhaps me not having any experience with the series before getting into this was not, you know, it was an unfavorable light is in this, in this case. So that's a possibility, but I'm glad that I read it and it was, you know, it wasn't a complete waste of time, but at the end of the day, it was only two stars. Next thing that I managed to finish was Lorelei by Laura Dockrell. This was the buddy read that Acacia and I decided to do months ago and finally got to. I think we both rated this similarly. I gave this three out of five stars. However, you may remember from my How I Rate Books video that why three is the saddest star rating. This is not a sad three stars. This is a like solid, good three star book. You know, it, I this wasn't a pity three stars. So that was good. This is a really lovely representation of what I want to three stars to be. So this was not terribly hard to read. There weren't any like suggestions in there that I particularly disagreed with, you know, as far as like tropes and stuff that can happen in YA and children's lit. The mermaid lore was interesting, though I found that it wasn't as fleshed out as I wanted it to be. For instance, there are scenes in here where the mermaids drink cocktails and smoke, and I'm just like, how though? How though? Because underwater and okay. Apart from those like mechanics that weren't quite filled in, which I expect in mermaid novels, this was interesting. It was a really different world. It was a really different sort of YA from the YA I've read. The ending was a bit subversive in my mind, but I thought that it was done maybe out of rebellion rather than because the narrative warranted it. And also the ending happened really quick. Like there, you didn't have a lot of breathing room between the climax and the end of the book. So I wish that there had been more of that, especially since this is a quite short YA, it's maybe like 330 pages. So if she had spent 50 more pages on like the resolution wrap up, I would have appreciated that. But I'm glad that I read this. I'm glad that it is in my mermaid book collection because it is definitely doing something very different than the other mermaid books that I have in my collection. I'm glad that I got to read this with Acacia as well. The next thing that I finished was The Magic Toy Shop by Angela Carter. And I too gave this two out of five stars, unfortunately. I'm glad that I tried out how... Carter does novels. However, if this is how all of her novels are, I don't think I'm going to be picking up anymore. So this is in essence, a story not about a magic toy shop because there's nothing magical in, in this story. There is a toy shop, but it's not magical. This is a story about Melanie and her two siblings, and they are orphaned and have to move in with their estranged Uncle Philip, with his mute wife, and then her two brothers, Finn and Francie. It's not a good situation. It's not a good home life. Like, it's not horrifying, but there is domestic abuse. There's a sexual assault scene, uh, which is weird. It's also really, really sensual in the beginning. And then there's there was just this dread the entire time that I was reading this. I was just like, oh, what horrible thing is going to happen next? Something horrible is going to happen next, I'm sure. Nothing super, super horrible happened, but the ending was just like, what? There's a thing that came out of nowhere and then the ending just like happened and there was yet again, like no resolution. This is a 200 page book and it just kind of like, ends and it ends at where like you don't even know where some of the characters are it i was just like Rah. also weirdly even though i could tell that this was like quality writing i mean it's angela carter i was like falling asleep while reading this a lot of the time it what just wasn't holding my attention and it was literally making me sleepy while reading it so that's never a good sign uh, unfortunately so if you want a weird kind of unsettling grungy story about you know a girl who has to find her way in the world after her life is drastically changed and some interesting characters weird family dynamics and then also puppet shows then this would be for you. It just wasn't for me. And finally, the last thing I finished, because I finished all the things on my list, yay! You guys must have been crossing your fingers and wishing on stars for me. I really appreciate that. But I managed to finish as Bird Spring Forth the Sun by Alistair MacLeod. I give this four out of five stars. The first story blew my mind. I was just like, mm -hmm. like I had this feeling in my stomach and chest like I was going to cry because it was just like somehow connecting with me on like a visceral soul level. It was so, I don't even know how to explain what I was feeling, but I was just like flabbergasted. I underlined at least a third of that first short story. It was just fantastic. So I'm going to read to you a bit uh, from that first story, just so you kind of get an idea about his writing style, because it's, it's a really understated writing style, but somehow it just got to my soul. 
So this first story is about a group of miners who are whiling away their time while the summer still is in, you know, full swing. They are going to be going to Africa to work in mines afterward. And so this starts out with following the miners as they're just enjoying the the sunshine on a beach off of Cape Breton. All of us have stood and turned our naked bodies unknown, unaccountable times beneath the spraying shower nozzles of the world's mining developments. Bodies that, when free of mud and grime and the singed hair smell of blasting powder, are white almost to the color of milk or ivory, perhaps of leprosy. Too white to be quite healthy, for when we work, we are often twelve hours in the shaft's bottom or in the development drifts, and we do not often feel the sun. All summer we have watched our bodies change their color and seen our hair grow bleached and even lighter. Only the scars that all of us bear fail to respond to the healing power of the sun's heat. They seem to stand out even more vividly now, long, running pink welts that course down our inner forearms or jagged sawtooth ridges on the taut calves of our legs. Many of us carry one shoulder permanently lower than the other where we have been hit by rock falls or the lop of the giant clam that swings down upon us in the narrow closeness of the shaft's bottom, and we have arms that we cannot raise above our heads and touches of arthritis in our backs and in our shoulders, magnified by the water that chills and falls upon us in our work. Few of us have all our fingers, and some have have lost either eyes or ears from falling tools or discharged blasting caps or flying stone or splintering timbers. Yet it is damage to our feet that we fear most of all, for loss of toes or damage to the intricate bones of heel or ankle means that we cannot support our bodies for the grueling 12-hour stand-up shifts, and injury to one foot means that the other must bear double its weight, which it can do for only a short time before poor circulation sets in to numb the leg and make it too inoperative. All of us are big men, over six feet tall and near 200 pounds, and our feet have, at the best of times, a great deal of pressure bearing down upon them. We are always intensely aware of our bodies and the pains that course and twinge through them. Even late at night when we would sleep, they jolt us unexpectedly, as if from an electric current, bringing tears to our eyes and causing our fists to clench in the whiteness of knuckles and the biting of nails into palms. At such times, we desperately shift our positions or numb ourselves from the tumblers of alcohol we keep close by our sides. Lying now upon the beach, we see the external scars on ourselves and on each other and are stirred to the memories of how they occurred. When we are clothed, the price we pay for what we do is not so visible as it is now. So it's just a simple story about miners and the dangers of mining and how they deal with their dead when they're on site in foreign countries and someone dies in an accident and about absorbing the last minutes of their Canadian summer before they're going to be gone from their families for months and months and months and it was just so quiet and so haunting and I just loved it. The rest of the stories weren't my jam as much as that one. That first one was called The Closing Down of Summer. Winter Dog and To Everything There Is a Season were both wonderful winter stories that I would love to reread close to winter time. And then there's three stories, Second Spring, The Tuning of Perfection, and As Birds Bring Forth the Sun, which have to do more with like farming and rural communities in Canada. And Vision is about having the second sight and how that is a burden to family members who have the second sight. McLeod is of Scottish descent and there is a lot of like Gaelic in here. You're not expected to know what it means, but a lot of references to, and then we sing the Gaelic songs. There's even an entire story about this family who is offered the chance to go sing Gaelic songs for some TV program. So it's very much like rural post industrial or pre-industrial Canada, but it's also Scottish immigrants and it's just so quiet and and I will be reading more by Alistair MacLeod, absolutely, because I've never been so interested in pastoral stories as I was in this. I'm so glad that even though there were three duds, two stars in this week, there was this four star and it was grand. So these are the books that I managed to finish over last week. Yay! Five more off the list of huge books that I have yet to read. Please let me know down below what you read this week. Like what was your highlight? Did you finish anything that was awesome? Did you finish anything that was absolutely horrid and you had a lovely time ranting about it? Let me know what you read this week. I would love to chat with you in the comments. Thank, thank, thank you for watching yet again. And until next time, continue to be lovely. Next, I pick up... <laughs>